John's going to follow with a word. This reading is Daniel 3 verses 8 to 28. King Nebuchadnezzar issued a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, flute, harp, pipe and all kinds of music must fall down and worship the image of gold and that whoever does not will be thrown into a blazing furnace. But there were some Jews, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, who paid no attention. They neither served his gods nor worshipped the image of gold. Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego and said to them, is it true that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I have set up? Now, when you hear the ha sound of the horn, flute, harp, pipe and all kinds of music, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what god will be able to rescue you from my hand? Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. He ordered the furnace to be heated seven times hotter than usual and commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So these men, wearing their robes and other clothes, were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement and asked his advisers, weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? They replied, Certainly, Your Majesty. He said, Look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, come out, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego came out of the fire, and he saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was a hair of their head singed. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own. Good morning, everybody. I'm going to indulge in a bit more military nostalgia following on from the VE celebrations last week. There was another famous World War II British military event that happened during May, something of a victory in defeat, or sometimes referred to as a miracle, of Dunkirk. Now things were looking pretty dicey for the British forces. There were 350,000 driven back to the beaches of Dunkirk by the advancing Nazi forces. And on May the 23rd, 1940, King George VI put out the proclamation requesting that the following Sunday, May the 26th, would be a national day of prayer. On the evening of Saturday, May the 25th, the order was given to evacuate as many troops from the Dunkirk beach as possible and a call was put out for rescuers. The next morning, churches were overflowing with men and women begging the Lord to save their sons, brothers, husbands, and long lineups stretched out the doors of the cathedrals, down the street, and crowds gathered by Westminster Abbey. Someone called Pamela Fillmore was an officer in the Women's Royal Naval Service, the Wrens, and she recorded the following memories of the time. One day in May 1914, Captain Cull, the Admiral's secretary, came with a signal and said, please double check this, VA Dover, evacuate the British Expeditionary Forces from France. And Operation Dynamo thus began. All stops were out, all signals seemed to be immediate and every day we sent out a signal to 11 Group at Biggin Hill for more air cover for the beaches of Dunkirk. Now the response for rescuers was overwhelming and over 800 vessels, yachts, merchant marine ships, small fishing boats heeded the call and those at home prayed for the safety. And with an unexplainable pause in the German advance, along with calm seas and misty conditions to provide cover from view, 
a rescue of epic proportions took place. And just as the British soldiers on the beach seemed sure they would be destroyed or captured by the oncoming Nazis, a British naval officer cabled three simple words to London. But if not. But if not. The British officer who sent those words expected those reading it to understand where they came from and exactly what they meant. And they come from the passage that Emily just read, although in the King James Version. And in that version, it's the specific reference is as follows. O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. The officer were declaring that they had confidence that the prayers of the nation would be answered and that the Lord would deliver them, but that in any case they were prepared to resist the Nazis up to and including giving the ultimate sacrifice. This was remarkable both that it was immediately understood by a genera generation so, literature, so literate in the scriptures, but also for the tremendous courage that it demonstrated. Now, courage remains uh, one of the values of the British Army today, and it's an attractive character trait for anyone, we might agree. We also see it is in God's heart for us as followers throughout Scripture. Moses says to Joshua in Deuteronomy 31, The Lord himself goes before you, and he will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Jesus says to Peter in Mark 14, Take courage. It is I. Do not be afraid. And there are many more examples. But what might we, might we need courage for today? We may not be in a war like the Second World War, though some have likened the pandemic response to being in some ways like a war. In the passage from Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego were being asked by Nebuchadnezzar to bow down and worship false gods or idols. They showed physical courage in the face of being thrown into a blazing furnace. And there are many today in this current crisis who are being asked to display physical courage in the face of physical danger. But I think we're all being called to show spiritual courage in the face of many spiritual dangers today. Now, images of gold might not feel tempting as something we might not might want to bow down and worship in the sense of maybe the, the singing we do on a Sunday morning. But there are, of course, different ways to think about what worship means. One understanding could be that we, in fact, worship whatever it is that rules our time, energy, thoughts, longings and choices. Now, what are we too afraid of giving up worshipping? What are the modern day idols that we need courage to resist or evacuate ourselves from? What things are there that occupy the highest place of affection in our diaries, in our bank statements, in our relationships, rather than worshipping God? Now, thinking back with thanks to the many courageous sacrifices and risks that those in previous generations took, Maybe we could reflect now on what sacrifices or risks we could make to more wholeheartedly worship God, to live a life not bowing down to the modern day golden images and making, as Steve Oliver challenged us, spiritual preparations for the days ahead. An, an economic recession, serious um, possibilities may be looming, but... Jesus is quite stark. We cannot serve both God and mammon, meaning money and possessions. Is the idol of financial independence and financial resource, wealth and security, something that might command the highest affection in our hearts? Perhaps giving regularly to support the work of the church, investing in the church for non-financial returns is, is something that takes courage that we might be called to step out in. Also our own image and reputation that can be front and centre in our thoughts, perhaps especially with social media so prevalent at the moment. Proverbs 9, 29 says, the fear of man lays a snare, but whoever trusts the Lord is safe. So is this idol of personal reputation occupying a place of high affection for us? Perhaps being vulnerable and open, taking the risks to invite friends or family to online church or alpha, or sharing that uh, marvellous church-wide blessing video, all those things take steps of, of courage. And Paul in Colossians advises us not to work only to please men, but work wholeheartedly fearing the Lord. Is the idol of career, working to get ahead, taking the place of highest affection, perhaps working 
overworking, uh, working into the evenings, working through the weekends? Could we be choosing rest, choosing to obey the command to build in Sabbath into our lives, trusting our careers to God? That also takes a step of courage. And I'm sure many of us watched Her Majesty the Queen speak on the E Day, reflecting how the current adversity has brought many positives in society. And she said, our streets are not empty. They are filled with the love and the care that we have for each other. So let's pray that God would continue to transform, shape and encourage his church at this time. Would we and others know that the church is not empty, but is filled with people who love the Lord their God with all their heart, mind and soul and love their neighbour as themselves. So hopefully you've all had a chance to hear this song already. Lord bless you and keep you Make his face shine upon you Be gracious to you The Lord turn his face toward you you and behind you. 